Welcome to the Beyond Sunday podcast, where we bring Sunday home. Join us as we dive deeper into First Baptist's weekly sermons, discuss practical applications, and answer your questions. Hello and welcome to the Beyond Sunday podcast. I'm Jordan Upton, the Director of Broadcast and Media Outreach here at First Baptist, and with me as always is Pastor Jeff Reynolds. Jeff, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. So today, I think we we need to let everybody know we're actually recording right after worship. Yes, we've sir. got a big week with the Kentucky Baptist Convention annual meeting uh, convening here. It's going to be the 185th meeting of the Kentucky Baptists. And so we uh, came straight to the recording booth right after worship uh, on the day that the lights went out yeah. at First Baptist Church. And so anybody who is here or tuned into the broadcast is going to remember this day. What a what an interesting moment. And I'm sitting here with the two guys who are in charge of uh, dealing with those things. And so thank you guys for your teams that you have prepared to, to just persevere through things. So that's a day we will never forget. Nope, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh-huh. man. All right, it's been a big day already, and it's a big day for the podcast. We're talking about James 5, 7 through 12. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord as at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. But above all, my brothers, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth, or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no, no, so that you may not fall under condemnation." So, Jeff, you've spoken several times about how it's God's mercy that delays the coming of Jesus the second time. It's his mercy for sinners to repent that delays uh, the coming of the Lord. Why is it that God is still concealed in this time? Why is it that it still is difficult to some degree? It it requires faith that God exists and that Jesus is Messiah and that he is coming back. Yeah, well, let me take you to the moment uh, at the end of the Gospel of John when Thomas becomes doubting Thomas. And you remember that Jesus has appeared to the disciples, and they've seen the risen Christ, but Thomas wasn't there. And he said, I'll never believe it until I can see him and put my hand in his wounds. I will not believe. So the day comes when Thomas is there and Jesus comes, and he says to Thomas, Put your hand in my wounds. Here, touch my hands, touch my side, see that it is I. And Thomas falls on his knees and says, Kuriosmu katheosmu, my Lord and my God. And he confesses his faith in Jesus, the risen Christ, the Messiah, God in flesh among us. And Jesus says to him, you believe because you have seen. Blessed are those who believe and yet will never see. And so I think that that's part of what Jesus is doing, that that we are required to come to him by faith, believing in that which we cannot see. Um, if we could just see it, then faith would not be required. It would be, oh, I'm, I'm smart enough to follow the trajectory of my eyes. Um, but we are in a time when coming to the Lord requires faith in that which we cannot see. And so... Um, I think that's why he's not as overt. That's why there's not some sort of sign. Jesus said to the those who demanded signs when he was on earth, he said, a, a perverse and twisted generation seeks after a sign. I tell you, no sign will be given except for the sign of Jonah. Well, what is the sign of Jonah? Jonah descended into the belly of the fish for three days. And uh, in the same way, Jesus descended into the earth for three days and rose again. So, um, you know, yeah, if there was a big supernatural explosion in the sky that said, Jesus is real, you should trust and follow him. I think a lot of people would take that and they would run with it. I think still some people would would scoff at that. Um, But the message of the gospel is that we are to believe though we do not see. The other thing is this, that he's left his church here and, and we are part of the visible 
element of who God is as his family, as his people, as we are to be um, a, a holy nation, just as Israel was supposed to be set apart for God's purposes and to reveal God to the world, so is the church to be a, a holy people set apart to God's purposes to reveal God to the world. And so some people take that and run with it and say, oh, well, our job is to hold picket signs that denounce every human being who ever sins ever. And I'm not saying that we don't point out sin. That's not it. But our call is to shine brightly the beacon of the gospel of Jesus Christ so that people will come to Christ and be saved. You know, a sinner is not going to stop sinning because I say so. Uh, or because I tell them that, that they have violated my moral standard or whatever, what's going to have to happen is they're going to have to come to Jesus. And so part of God's revelation of himself on the earth now comes through his church, his people, the redeemed of this age, um, who are responsible for, for sharing that message. Yeah. So in some sense, it's like we're like Noah. It's like we're, we're building the ark. We're not uh, opening the floodwaters of heaven. That's right. And, and, and again, just as Noah could not control when the flood waters would come, uh, so we do not control when Christ will return. He will return when it is the Father's good and pleasing will. And uh, until then, we're to remain faithful. Um, anticipating, uh, as Peter would say, even seeking to wait for and hasten the coming of the day of the Lord, saying along with John, come Lord Jesus. But until then, um, we'll be faithful in inviting as many people as we can to come with us. So at the end of this passage, James says, above all, do not swear, but let your yes be yes and your no, no. So why are rash oaths of such high concern to James? Well, I think they're of such high concern to James because they were of such high concern to Jesus. And let me read to you from Matthew chapter 5, verses 33 through 37, what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. He said again, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say simply be yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. So again, what you have Jesus saying and what you have James echoing is this call for God's people to be straightforward in their communication and not to be deceptive um, and not to have a need to take an oath. And, and so I've had friends, I'm sure we've all had friends um, who at times will seek to emphasize what they're saying by saying either I swear to God uh, or I swear upon so-and-so's grave or I swear upon my life. Well, if I'm living the sort of life that expresses a character of integrity, then everything I'm saying to you should be straightforward and true. I shouldn't have to evoke some sort of oath to say, well, no, but what I'm saying now is really true, if that makes sense. Yeah. And now some people take this to mean that if, for example, they have to testify in court and they ask you to place, raise your right hand and, and some, in some cases place your left hand on the Bible, um, I've, <laughs> I've had to testify and they didn't ask me to place my hand on the Bible, but I did have to raise my right hand. And uh, there are some people who take that to say, don't swear that oath that in that moment you're, you're going to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Um, some people feel like that that's sin. And I would say if it violates their conscience, then function accordingly. Um, I raised my right hand and said, yes, all of you people in this room who don't know me, I didn't say these words, but the purpose of it was, Your Honor, Judge, you don't know me. Um, all the people in this courtroom, you don't know me. So I'm going to say in this moment, yes, what I'm saying uh, is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me, God. Um, if I'm with my family, I should not have to say, no, but I'm telling the truth this time. They know me. If I'm with my friends, I should not have to say, no, but I'm telling the truth this time. Uh, if I'm at my place of employment and I've been there long enough, I shouldn't have to say, but I'm really telling the truth this time. And I think that that's the idea, that we ought to be people of, of such character, having been and continuing to be transformed by the Holy Spirit, that we don't have to go to those lengths to say, no, but this time I really mean it. And Jesus even says, look, don't swear to God. You have no control over God. Don't swear by heaven. You have no control. Don't swear by the earth. You, I mean, you, frankly, 
uh, you don't have the degree of control that you think you do over the earth. In fact, don't even swear by your head because as I am learning now the hard way, white hairs just show up out of nowhere <laughs> and I can't make them quit. So just be a person of integrity and speak with honesty. So that takes us to today's listener question. Listeners, if you have a question, just go to the link in the show notes or leave a comment on this post. So today's question is, in the Bible, leavened bread is used several times as a symbol of wickedness. Is there something wrong with leavened bread? I sure hope not, because I love leavened bread. Yeah. Um, I've tried to go keto a few times over the years to try to lose weight, and it's, in my estimation, a miserable way to live. Um, in fact, I, I uh, bring in bread and butter into my diet steadily. So anyway, um, that's a great and very thoughtful question, because the the the, the concept of leaven comes up even every time we celebrate the Lord's Supper. You know, we're using unleavened bread. Well, why is that? Well, that harkens back to the Passover. So when Israel was enslaved in Egypt and God was going to deliver his people by the Passover, um, they were to bake bread without leaven. And the reason was they were in a hurry. They had to go. They didn't have time to wait for the bread to rise. So they ate unleavened bread. And in fact, God gave them specific instructions as to how to eat it. Eat ready to go. In our day, have the car packed up, have made your trip to the restroom, you know, get your jacket on and be ready to go. It's time to go. I'm I'm saving you. I'm redeeming you. So every year when the Passover Seder was celebrated and the celebration of the Passover subsequent to that, they ate unleavened bread. They had the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And, and the point was to remember this, this time when they were under oppression, but God was liberating them. And God was liberating them according to his timeline. It wasn't because of Pharaoh's benevolence, and it wasn't because of Moses' uh, smooth talk. It was because of God's mighty hand and outstretched arm. So you have that, and that's why today when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we use unleavened bread because when Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, they were celebrating the Passover. They were eating matzah, unleavened bread, and so we continue that today. But then in the New Testament, there is this use of leaven as an amazing metaphor to help us understand how sin grows. Okay, so in, in Galatians chapter 5, beginning with verse 7, the Apostle Paul writes to the churches of Galatia saying, You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. And the idea that Paul is trying to get along here is if you let in just a little bit of sin, if you let in just a little bit of false teaching, if you let in just a little bit of that which God has condemned, then it's going to spread. And then in James, uh, this book we've been going through in James chapter 1, beginning with verse 14, James writes, But each person is tempted when he is lured and, his and is enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. So the idea here is just as yeast works, it way, works its way through a dough. And once you've got leaven in a dough, you can't unleaven it. It's, it's going to spread. That's the way it works. Um, sin works its same way in our lives. False teaching works that same way in our community. So it's not that there's something wrong with leaven. Um, it's just that it's an amazing analogy to help us understand that we have to be vigilant. And, you know, one of my jobs here at First Baptist Church is to ensure that what is taught here is in accord with God's Word because little little aberrant teachings can come in and they can, they can catch— fire quickly. Uh, to use the same metaphor, they can start spreading through the whole lump of dough quickly, and then all of a sudden you've got yourself a problem. And so we have to be careful that what is taught here comes from God's Word. And uh, that's why anybody who preaches here, people who teach here, uh, we do our best to make sure that they are, are vetted, frankly, um, according to do they teach uh, what is in accord with the Word of God and not contrary to the Word of God. So... Great question from a great listener. Yeah, so in thinking about uh, making matzah, uh, when you're making unleavened bread, it's it's you know it's bread, but you bake it really hot, really quick, so that it doesn't have time to start fermenting and start leavening. Huh? 
Yeah. So it made me think about how, you know, it's like we need to be tested by the refiner's fire in some sense and, you know, live the life of discipleship to Jesus and, you know, pick, carrying our cross and in some sense being, you know, um, going through uh, the fire so that we have the imperfections, you know, removed from us and that we are some sort of unleavened, uncorrupted, you know, in the end resurrected uh, yeah. people unto Christ um, and not having, like you're talking about, heresy or uh, sin, death, uh, rottenness, decay, fermentation, leavening going on in us that causes us to stumble and lose sight of Christ. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. And um, it's vitally important that we remain vigilant because it's, I mean, we've all seen it happen in our own lives. You, 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 you put a toe on the slippery slope and then here you go. And uh, then you're having to deal with consequences and cleanup messes that you otherwise wouldn't have had to fool with. So that's right. Jeff, it's been a big week. Thank you for another great podcast. Do you mind praying us out for today? Yeah, I do. And let me say to everyone who has been a part of serving uh, as we have welcomed the Kentucky Baptist Convention, as we continue through our regional collections for Operation Christmas Child, we have had a ton going on. And I just want to say thank you to everybody who has in any way used your gifts and talents and resources um, to serve the body of Christ and to and to help us carry out the callings to which we've been called in this moment. It's been a big stretch, a big season here at First Baptist Church. We're so thankful for what God has done, but I just want to say thank you to everyone who is serving. Let's pray together. Father, we love you, and we thank you that you loved us first. And you shouldn't have, but you did, and we're so thankful. And so, Lord, let us be bolstered by the strength that you give. Let us be protected by the peace that you provide, and let us constantly seek to be the people who surrender to your will, who are filled to overflowing with your Holy Spirit, and who live our lives in ways that honor you and bless others. Lord, we believe that our city should be better because we're here, and you're in us, and you've put us here for such a time as this. And so, Lord, we pray that we would live out the faith once for all delivered to the saints in a way that shows the world there's a God in the heavens who loves them, whose standard is immovable, and who will be the righteous judge, but who in this moment has his arms open to receive them through Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, help us to be faithful. We ask these things trusting you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe to our channel. To submit a question about Sunday's sermon, the Bible, or walking with Jesus, Click the link in the episode description. Our hosts today are Pastor Jeff Reynolds and myself, Jordan Upton. Our engineer is Elliot Beckley.